Ring a ring a rosy As the light declines I'll remember Dublin City In the rare old times Louis Lenton has had a distinguished career as one of Ireland's foremost drama and theatre drama television producer directors. He's worked as head of OTE Drama, and also he's worked as a director abroad in Israel, France, England, and the United States. We're very pleased to have him here this evening. He's also produced um, The Voice of Shem, which was widely acclaimed theatrical piece, and he has also, uh, for television, produced extracts from Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. Louis is also a great friend to the museum, and by public demand, he has shown on several occasions here his two exquisite documentaries, the No More Blooms and Grandpa Speak to Me in Russian. I can't tell you how happy I am to have him here, so I hope you'll put your hands together, please, and welcome Mr. Louis Manson. Thank you all for coming along. Uh, I'd really like to thank Elkin and Yvonne and everybody who now seems to operate the museum in a wonderful fashion for inviting me along and giving me an opportunity to um, commemorate an event 22 years ago. And that is the reason why I've titled this, in a way, a continuation from 1992. Because in 1992, three of us gave papers. That was the first time I read this piece in a slightly different form. I've been working on it, playing around with it for a long, long time. But it was a wonderful symposium. The three speakers were the late uh, <laughs> Gerald Goldberg, Mr. Ziv, and myself. Got to forget Mr. Ziv. The <laughs> late Mr. Ziv. <laughs> They're both late, unfortunately. But anyway. Okay, so that's the continuation from 1992, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Okay, I've titled this, I don't understand, I fail to say, I do see you too. So, our noun for now, long, long ago, timeless. Before Joshua and Judges had given us numbers of Leviticus committed Deuteronomy. In truth, only a bare 50 years ago to be exact. I directed the Irish stage premiere of The Voice of Shem. Mary Manning's eloquent premiere, eloquent adaptation of extracts from Finnegan's Wake, the first attempt to stage either the night or the day book in Ireland. So, please picture the scenario deep into the second act. The audience not so much in transports of joy as paroxysms of bewilderment. Then, as the nightmare afar from morning years, before the nightmare creasework puzzle of Finnegan's weight could dissolve, while the dab of great dawn drags nearly nigh to the wake of old runners that drowsed in Dublin, <clears throat> the corpse of Finnegan suddenly sits erect in his coffin, centre stage, stares about him, and then cries out as well he might, where are we at all, and whenabouts in the name of space? To which, not unreasonable demand, he himself replies with the semi-mortal words, I don't understand. I fail to say. I do see you too. It might be helpful to know that at this point in the continuation, Dadad's loftiest pearl daughter pearl, Isolt, just married to the strains of hymnibus number 29 in the setting my father Blissius Mendelssohn dies with the immortal cry of Mildun Liza and is borne off stage to the opening bars of Wagner's immortal Liebestor. Probably leaving the audience even more confused and flabbergasted than poor old big Mr. Finnegan, who was of course himself about to begin again. <laughs> so the line that I have appropriated as the title to this homily, I don't understand, I fail to say, I dare see you too. Coming from Earwick of Finnegan, now well and truly waked in his coffin, usually brought the house back. I have no wish, however, to loft the smog from Finnegan, 
but rather to conduct a Jewish wake. Sit shiver, for the soul of Leopold Bloom was shumit, turncoat extraordinaire. So I invite you all to sit down and listen all, to join me, if you will, on this personal and hopefully not too incommodious likeness into the heart of this Hibernian uh, metropolis. While I attempt to expose, juxtapose three strands, firstly the fact that Leopold Bloom, constantly referred to throughout Ulysses and ever since as a Jew, is in strict Jewish religious terms a fake. He's not a Jew at all. Secondly, all that Joyce said his masterpiece for very specific and personal reasons on June the 16th, 1904. Apart from one short and perhaps questionable reference, the book appears to completely ignore the largest anti-Semitic outbreak in Ireland up to that time, and thankfully since. I refer, of course, to the 1904 pogrom in Limerick, where that small Jewish community was subjected to vilification and physical attack, leading within a year to its decimation. Those events were fully reported in both the Irish and London press of the time, and there is little doubt that the Joyce must have been aware of them. My third strand, which I would like to delve into first, derives from a number of personal anti-Semitic experiences provoked by my own position as an Irish Jew in Catholic Ireland. Now, such anti-Semitism as exists here is unfortunately in no way unfamiliar to me and my co-religionists, forming part of the growing pains, and indeed the pain, of many grown-up Irish Jews. There can be few amongst us who have gone through life without some anti-Semitic experience, no matter how mild. I recall as a very young boy not being invited to my annual Christmas, school Christmas party, with both, which both my sister and I had previously enjoyed, not because we were the only Jewish children in the Protestant school in Limerick, as it happened, but because, as it was pointedly put to my father, it was a party only for children of the parish. One lived through relatively unimportant experiences of that nature, but suddenly, one day, my position as an outsider was indelibly imprinted on me, ironically by a remark from a colleague. We were at the time in the middle of a heated discussion, as was our wont, concerning a television play I was to direct. A play that revolved around events during the Irish Civil War and in particular the dramatist's rather watery theme of understanding or misunderstanding between free staters and republicans. When suddenly my colleague said, and I will never forget the moment, how could you possibly understand? You're not Irish, you're Jewish. The remark was not meant to hurt, but simply to state that in the context of matters specifically Irish, I was not a member of the parish, never would be, and accordingly there were certain matters I could not be expected to comprehend. Of course, who has ever heard of an Irish Jew? It does sound like a bit of a joke. Polly may be a bit of a card, but I assure you the late General Goldberg, the Dick Whittington of Cork City, was very much an Irish Jew. It is the only possible label I could give myself, and the author of the collection of short stories published under the title, Who Has Ever Heard of an Irish <coughs> Jew? The late writer and editor, David Marcus, also very much a member of the local command of the loyal Yiddish sons of St. Patrick, mm -hmm. as indeed are so many other Irish jury. Irish jury may on occasions prefer to bury his collective head in the sand, but many of us do stand up for the potshots. Nevertheless, the title, who has ever heard of an Irish Jew has a faint aura of truth about it. Not perhaps as strong as the tang of urine in Poldy's poor kidney, who despite Jewish Lord Mayors of Catholic City, judges, members of Dorley Urban, writers, performers, musicians, university professors, a doctor of sociology, and even a scattering of film and television producers. Direct. Apart from the odd success with doctor, dentist, lawyer, accountant, Mr. Deasy's anti-Semitic remark in a Nestor chapter of Ulysses, regrettably, were 
I knew this would happen sometime. <laughs> this, anyway, regrettably, still holds some. Ireland, he says, has the honor of being the only country which never persecuted the Jews. And you know why? Because she never let them in. The vitally important word in that passage, as far as I'm concerned, is in. Fully in. <coughs> Not half in or with one foot in the door. My English dictionary defines the word in as, amongst other things, belonging to, being a member of, of having a share of party. So perchance Mr. Dizzy was spot on enough. <coughs> the second, the supposed split allegiance of many Jewish communities is often thrown up, as if to say, how can there be such a thing as an Irish or a French or a Jewish or a Swiss Jew, for that matter? I suggest that the question arises only in the minds of citizens who have some difficulty, even today, in welcoming Jews and others in, totally in, in the fullest sense of the word. Leopold Bloom, when questioned, what is your nation, if I may ask, can only reply as we all would, Ireland. I was born here, Ireland. But the very asking begs the question. And though many Irish Jews are all around us, like Bloom, until relatively recently, when we wanted to play ball, it could only be done in Jewish alleys. <coughs> John Wise Nolan may come to the rescue and ask, why can't a Jew love his country like the next fella? But invariably, someone like J.J. O'Malloy is bound to respond, why not? Well, he's quite sure which country it is. <laughs> I'm not being anti-Irish. What I say now is not intended as any way as an attack on society. It has an extremely low level of public anti-Semitism. My personal experiences are not unique to this country. No doubt others elsewhere will have had their own anonymous mail, such as letters I received while head of television drama at RTE. One threatening me with the Irish army. Which of the two, I'm not sure. <laughs> if I as a Jew continued to, de uh, to decide which plays Irish viewers could see. Another denouncing me for attempting to produce a play that had as its central theme a fanatical Roman Catholic, unacceptable in his fanaticism even to his own community, <laughs> that in reality dealt with the Italian owners of a fish and chip shop in a small country town. And relatively recently, the predictable spate of phone and letters accusing me of church bashing, consequent on the transmission of my television documentary Dear daughter. So I feel that it is worth asking if there really is any different difference between the attitude <coughs> and opinions Joyce provides for his wholly observed cast of Dubliners in 1904 and those expressed to me openly and anonymously many years later. Do we Jews of the diaspora like Leopold Brun still only exist in a limbo of alienation? Have we still only cherished expectations? However, let me continue on my vicus and wander with Leopold Bloom on the 16th of June, 1904. Bloom, the Yiddish boy, or if I may present you with a riddle, when is a Jew not a Jew? Any takers? <laughs> when he is in Bloom. <laughs> it's an oft quoted couplet. A lot of God to choose the Jews. Maybe so. But an even more odd of Shem to pen a Jew who is not a Jew. And as a jest, or indeed maybe out of ignorance, but I doubt it, ironically provides him with a wife. A maid, Marian, who although brought up as a Catholic, is in fact the daughter of a Jewess from Gibraltar. I can find no reference to either mother or daughter, Millie, ever having converted. So strictly speaking, Molly Bloom is more a fully paid up member of Wanderers <laughs> than her husband. <laughs> Joyce, of course, liked to have his little joke. But his knowledge of Judaism was garnered from many sources. Some, perhaps, as far as the required Jewish religious law was concerned, perhaps not quite the full shadow. Who? as a total Jew, not an assessment. 
Why did Joyce carefully set out his genealogy, which states without doubt that his peripatetic hero was anything but kosher? It had been regarded without question by all and sundry then and since as a Jew. What would the book have lost or gained had Joyce gone the whole hog? This is not something that as a casual paddler in the Joyce stream I'm going to dip my tumpty tum toes into, but rather leave it to the deep sea anglers. But may I remind you that if your mother is Jewish, then so are you. In this sense, your father's religion is a road. It might be helpful, though, at this stage to take a brief look at the Bloom family tree. Rudolf Virag, Leopold Bloom's father, a Hungarian, <coughs> decides in 1850 or thereabouts to emigrate, first to London, then finally to Dublin, where he was no doubt welcomed by his bearded co religionists. But in 1865, after a visit to the Society for Promoting Christianity among Jews, he becomes a super and is converted to Protestantism. In that year, and the events may not be unconnected, he marries Ellen Higgins. And though at the time there was, strangely enough, a Dublin Jewish family with that surname, this Ellen Higgins is Protestant. Virag now changes his name to Blue. Virag is Hungarian for flower. So the bloom, while having a decided Jewish ring to it, has the added attraction of not being too far removed from the original. Bloom also has the advantage of being a common name among Jewish communities, then and now. The game, of course, is still being played. <coughs> Which blooms were the bloom blooms? Then, in 1866, a very old leap of bloom is born and promptly baptized a Protestant. Joyce, never a man for half measures, has our hero christened Leopold, a name deriving from the old High German, Lutpald, signifying its owner as a man of the Lut or people, distinguished by being bold or bald. To ironically emphasize this boldness, Molly's pet name for her husband is Poldy. Surely it, it is also no accident that the first syllable of his name, Leo, <coughs> which, of course, nobody ever uses, allows for an ironic and apt resonance, this time with the Lion of Judah. Apart from Poldy, he is never addressed or referred to as anything other than Bloom, keeping him decidedly in this place. As the boy grows up, the old man, Rudolf, passes on to our young... God, this is going to keep happy. I'm sorry about this. passes on to our young Leo, Leo the Lionhearted a certain amount of Yiddishkeit. The Alphabet, parts of the Haggadah, Passover story of the Exodus from Egypt, the first line of the Shema, the core prayer of Judaism, linking Jews to the monotheistic God. But Joyce, as if to make assurance triply sure, has Pauli dipped not once, but twice at baptism, a second time by doubting Irish boys under the parish pump in swords. And finally, irony of ironies, in order to enable him to marry his maid Marion, makes him as Irish as possible could possibly be. And has him finally doused in, doused in Ireland, in oil, this time as a Roman Catholic. A sham work, ever the one. You might say that Joyce has done his best for Groom, Jewish father. Protestant at birth, Roman Catholic by choice, but still regarded for all time as a Jew. I ask you, how far do you have to go to be let in? <laughs> <laughs> Both Bloom's children, Moody and Millie, assuming that Millie or her mother never converted to Catholicism, are paradoxically also Jewish. Joyce deprived Polly of his only son, Rudy, but Billy, if she hangs in the will produce Jewish offspring. So in 1904, we have the all-round bloom, Meshugana Meshurit, a crazy turncoat, if ever there was one. No less adrift in his own personal odyssey than Homer's Semitic hero. This, if you don't mind me saying so, is more than a bit of a card.
But is it really of any importance? And if so, why? <coughs> why has Joyce chosen to place at the heart of Ulysses, and Bloom surely is its very heart, and so, a wandering, hapless citizen, to label him on all sides a Jew, to grant him humanitarian characteristics, thoughts, and attitudes that place him apart from his fellow citizens, and yet deny him the finest cut of all. Is Bloom, like Moses, only to be granted a Pisgah view of his promised land? Bloom is certainly conscious of his Jewish heritage. He carries it with him, not only physically. He knows, remembers, retains, hangs on to threads of Jewish knowledge given him as a boy by his Jewish apostate father. As as much Hebrew as many Jews wandering around Dublin today, may break fast with a pork kidney published from the butcher's shop owned by the Hungarian Jew, Duke Lugash, later worries about the contents of Plumtree's potted meat. As he buys his pork kidney, Lugash asks him with his eyes for the recognition of a compatriot. But the prudent bloom decides, no, better not, another time. However, our peripatetic hero can on occasions muster the courage to declare himself as when he retorts to the anti-Semitic jibes of the citizen. And says he, Mendelssohn was a Jew, and Karl Marx, and Mercadante, and Spinoza, and the Savior was a Jew, and his father was a Jew, your God. He had no father, better do now. Whose God, said the citizen? Well, his uncle was a Jew, says he. Your God was a Jew, Christ was a Jew, like me. God, the citizen, made a plunge into the back of the shop. By Jesus, says he, I brain that bloody Jewman for using the holy name. By Jesus, I'll crucify him, so I will. <laughs> so, in his own way, Bloom takes a Jewish stance. Carries a candle, a light to enlighten the Gentiles. Joyce grants him a smattering of culture. There's a touch of the artist about old Bloom. Mozart and Meyerbeer figure among his favorite composers. But personally, I find his cultural judgments unreliable, and only half assimilated. It may sound snobbish, but I'd be apprehensive that Bloom, if he went to a concert other than by his wife, would loudly break into applause between movements. <laughs> <laughs> in this, as in so many other ways, Joyce never permits him to be a whole man. Rather to his own end has created a man adrift. Sorry an exile in his hometown. Irish only by birth, Jewish only by inclination, half and half a fellow that's neither fish nor flesh nor good red herring, yet Bloom belongs only in Dublin, a fitting chief literary citizen of that city of paralysis. A paid up member of the dominant church, a Jew yet not a Jew, a Christian? What do you mean? Mulligan calls him the wandering Jew, a neat label, in so many respects, Bloom is indeed more wandering than a Jew. Above all else, this wandering Jew desires identity. Bloom's journey through Dublin on June the 16th, 1904, a journey he will repeat every day of his life, is a desperate search for an identity that he will always be denied. Opting for the baptismal oil, his Jewish isolation becomes all the more complete. Not accepted by his Christian cohorts, he is denied intimacy with either group. Let me in, he cries. Certainly Molly will not. He is forced to climb over in his own railings. No man needed a key more. Of course, all this suits Joyce's purpose admirably. Bloom, as we all know, corresponds to Ulysses, the wandering Greek. One adrift at sea, the other beached on dry land, yet both desperately seeking a way home. I don't have to tell you that Joyce's masterpiece reeks with Homeric allusions. The structure is not only based on, but stylistically reflects the Greek hero's adventures. Ulysses is, of course, a hero on the grand scale. Bloom is anything but. Or could it be part of Joyce's scheme of things? that it takes certain heroic qualities to exist in an alien society. But not too much, if you don't mind. Too much of the hero 
a balloon might just conceivably break free and follow Joyce's personal example. That would never do. Pathetically eager to claim himself as 100% Irish, Bloom is careful not to overproclaim his Jewishness. Like Homer's hero, also a man of many devices, he knows that his modus operandi is to be circumspect. He can but wander and endure, without complaining too much about what the gods may send. No doubt the incongruity of creating his central Dublin as a Jew, not yet not fully a Jew, moreover a Jew who has sampled not one but three religions without accepting any of them, attracted Joyce with its satirical possibilities. Such a theme, of course, also parallels Joyce's own rejection of Catholicism. Bloom adrift in Catholic Ireland also mirrors Joyce's own increasing feeling of alienation in Europe. His place there being as ambiguous as that of Jews in Ireland. Like Bloom, Joyce is not a citizen of no place, nor an adapted citizen of any place. Despite his many efforts to be accepted, but it would seem from being allowed to buy his round, Paul Lee never fully gets a look in. You get the picture in this extract from the impatient cognoscenti in Barney Kieran's pub. So in comes Martin, asking, where was Bloom? Where is he, says Leopold, says Lanahan, defrauding widows and orphans. Isn't that a fact, says John Wise, when I was telling the citizen about Bloom and the Sinn Féin. That's so, said Martin. I saw their age. Who made those allegations said Alf? I said, Joe, I'm the alligator. <laughs> and after all, this is John Wise, why can't a Jew love his country like an ex -father? Oh, why not, says Junior, this is JJ, when he's quite sure which country it is. Is he a Jew or a Gentile or a Holy Roman or a Swatter or what the hell is he, says Ned. Or who is he? Oh, no offense, Crofton. We don't want him, says Crofton, the Irishman or Presbyterian. Who is Julius, says JJ. <coughs> He's a perverted Jew, says Martin, from a place in Hungary. And it was he who drew up all the plans according to the Hungarian system. We know that in the castle. Isn't he a cousin of Bloom the dentist, says Jack Cobb? Not at all, says Martin. Only namesake. His name was Virag, the father's name that poisoned himself. He changed it by deed poll, the father did. Oh, there's the new Messiah for Ireland, says the citizen. Island of saints and sages. A wolf in sheep's clothing, says the citizen. That's what he is. Virai from Hungary, a uh, sailor's they call cursed by God. All charity to the neighbor, says Martin. But where is he? We can't wait. Do you know what I'm telling you? It would be an act of God to take a fellow the whole, take hold of a fellow the like of that and throw him in the bloody sea. St. Patrick would want to land amongst us again to Balik and Lar and convert us to the system of allowing things like that to contaminate our shore. Martin kind of suggestion that Bloom was behind Arthur Griffith's idea that Ireland should emulate Hungary in its attempt to gain independence in the light of Griffith's other, other writings in the United Irishman at the time, provides another macabre <coughs> allusion that Joyce prefers not to take firm. Griffith's The Resurrection of Hungary began appearing serially in the United Irishman through the first half of that year. The purpose of the work, as Griffith explained, was to tell the story of how the resurrection of Hungary was developed by Hungarian patriots and to propose the adoption of a similar plan for use by Sinn Féin. But let me leave the founder of Sinn Féin, ourselves, alone for the moment to move on to our third strand. From the world of fiction to the harsh reality of life in Limerick for the Jewish community in 1904, <coughs> You will, of course, recall that the Dreyfus Affair, which continued until 1906, reached its crisis in 1902, just before Joyce's arrival in Paris. Excuse me. Just before Joyce's arrival in Paris. In 1903, Joyce returned to Ireland, just in time for the Limerick pogrom, a virulent and violent outburst of anti-Semitism that decimated that small community. While not strictly speaking a pogrom in the extreme Russian sense, 
Jews were attacked and hurt, and a, and a ruinous financial boycott imposed. Sides were taken by leading Irish figures, Arthur Griffith to the fore, and the sorry event became in its own way a cause celebre, for which when he came to write Ulysses, Joyce, in my opinion, must have been fully aware. He hunted down so much detail that a seemingly deliberate choice not to touch directly on that event, which impinged on every Irish Jew, bears some consideration. In June 1904, the Limerick pogrom was in full spectrum. You could say, I suppose, in full bloom. And one might have expected some reference to it in Ulysses, so specifically set in the same year. Yet apart from one possible moment from the Cyclox chapter set in Barney Kilman's pub, and perhaps some oblique references by Molly during her final soliloquy, which in my personal opinion failed to connect, it would appear to be absolutely ignored. Certainly, despite some scholarly claims, I can't see that it provides the book with any overt tension. But let's, let us look at that moment in the past. And I belong too to a race, Bloom, that is, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant, God, he nearly burns his fingers with the butt of his old cigar. Robbed, says he, plundered, insulted, persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, says he, putting up his fist, sold by auction in Morocco, like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the New Jerusalem, says the citizen? I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Wise, stand up to it then with force, like men. If we examine this passage, it reveals a persistent use of the present tense. Bloom speaks of persecution and insult. Insult. Also now, this very moment, this very instant. Then we hear, sold by auction off in Morocco. Why is Bloom concerned with Morocco all of a sudden? Well, if we substitute the old French name Le Maroc for Morocco, mm. the line read quickly now becomes sold by auction off in Lamarck. Mm. Not too far sounding, I suggest, from the sequence, uh, sorry, not too far sounding, I suggest, uh, from Limerick. And if you go along with this interpretation, it does give the sequence a far greater significance, signaling perhaps that Joyce realized he had to make some references, no matter how oblique to events on his doorstep. But it does appear to be the only reference in the entire book, if indeed that is what it is. This elegant interpretation belongs, I must say, not to me, but to Dorothy Offrey, a true Joyce. A brief moment in Finnegan's Wake may just also allude to the Limerick program. Two words, Limerick's disgrace. However, in the content of lace, for which Limerick was justly famous, and Nicholas, and seeing that the words come as they do immediately after, feminine reservations and ribbons of lace. Any connection is, I think, like lace. On the whole, only holes tied together. I can understand Bloom, and sure of his own identity, conscious both of his heritage and his present Roman Catholic status, desperately seeking acceptance among his Gentile brothers. Being careful not to bring this contentious subject out into the open. But there can be little doubt but that Joyce appears to deliberately goes out of his way to avoid it. Arthur Griffin, writing in the United Irishmen, however, had no difficulty in compounding Limenick's disgrace with anti-Semitic invective. Commenting that his sympathy went out to our countrymen, the artisan, whom the Jew deprives of the means of livelihood, to our countrymen, the traitor, whom he ruins in business with unscrupulous methods, to our countryman, the farmer, he draws into his usurer's toil and drives into the workers or across the water. We are glad Father Craig has given the advice he did. We trust he will continue. Given his business, or his line of business, it is unlikely this would have escaped Bloom. But Joyce allows of no specific comment. Why? To have created Bloom as an all round fully fledged member of the Jewish community in Ireland, were not to <coughs> Joyce's purpose. and was certainly not have allowed him to construct Ulysses <coughs> as he did. Bloom as a Jew in the fullest sense must surely necessitate protagonists from the Jewish community, which in turn would have made it almost impossible for Joyce to avoid placing the Limerick event in a prominent position. 
is a story worth writing, but not the book that Joyce wished to write. Therefore, I suggest that Leopold Bloom could be a Jew in every sense, but a fully religious one. Otherwise, the book could not have reflected, as it so wonderfully does, the triangular relationship and parallels between Ulysses the Greek, Leopold Bloom, the non-Jew, non-Christian, an exile in Dublin, just as much at sea in its streets, and accepted by both Jew and Christian alike, and Joyce himself, who, renouncing his own Catholic upbringing, committed himself to exile. Miller imposed on it himself. Okay. Now, anyway, for my final start. When Joyce started preparing, preparing to write Ulysses in 1907, the echoes of the Dreyfus affair had not yet settled. Events in Limerick were still to hand. Joyce was far from being a propagandist. This was not his style. But he was attracted to the chosen isolation of the Jew, with it would seem an affinity with Jews as a wandering, persecuted people. Characteristics he saw in himself. Both that crafty Yid, the real live Dreyfus, and the fictional Bloom, a wolf in sheep's clothing, exist under the constant <coughs> accusation of not belonging. Dreyfus, an assimilated French Jew, tried and found guilty, as you know, of being a traitor before being subsequently acquitted. Bloom, never acquitted of the false slur of not knowing what country he belonged to, the analogy between the two and the vilified Jews of Limerick in 1904 is, I believe, evident. What more apt response by Joyce to events in a corner of his native land and in the wider European context, than to place at the as the central character in the book that was to change the face of English literature, a Jew, yet not a Jew, a drifter, a cuckold, above all, an outcast. Tickling Kybert reminds us that Ulysses is, after all, a newspaper, a distinctly Dublin one without a foreign section. <laughs> Joyce wished to move on from the detailed epiphanies of Dublin. The world would be his oyster, but it was still the world of Dublin. Paralyzed it may have been, yet its streets and denizens, from swerve of shore to bend of bay, forever, <coughs> is forever his sole tabula rasa. But could it be that Ulysses is in fact a very eloquent, covert response by this most humanitarian of writers, not only to the persecution of Dreyfus? but more particularly to the persecution of the isolated groups of innocents, des immigrants desperately seeking shelter against the bigoted randomings of the redemptist Father Craig. Choice scholars have penned themselves dry on the new type of Ulysses, the dramatic comparisons, the style, who was Junius, or would have been perhaps the larger measure, the motivation. Under no illusions about his fellow countrymen, it is just conceivable that in his very unique way, we can allow ourselves to consider Ulysses as Joyce's Jacques. The theme of Ulysses is surely that redemption comes through love and the power of the soul. The book ends not with an onanistic cry, but, a, with, but with a great big yes of affirmation, of acceptance, of love, the only opposite response to bigotry and hatred. But it's no use to see force, hatred, history, all that, that's not life for men and women, insulted and hatred. Everybody knows that's the very opposite of what of that, what is really life. What, says Alfred, loves to bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. Oh, I must go now, says John Boyce, just around the corner a moment to see if Martin is there. If he comes just back, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. And off he pops, like grease like me. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Boyce, isn't that what we're told? Love your neighbor. <clears throat> Joyce, I suggest, achieves this theme solely through the unholy trinity of Molly, Jewish daughter of the exotic Lolita Lafayette, Leopold Bloom, and Stephen Devils. Molly, unfaithfully faithful in spite of herself, ends the day by yielding once more to her husband. In the kitchen, Stephen will not stay the night for a brief moment. The coaches of Stephen Devils, the Greek Christian Irishman, Leopold Bloom Ben Ulysses, the Greek Jewish Irishman, 
unite against the forces of horsepower and brutality in favor of brain power and decency. Ulysses, of course, can be all books to all men. The day and nightmare volumes, he pays your money and he takes your tour. Ulysses the Greek covered much of the Mediterranean Sea during his 10 year voyage. Bloom, a voyager amongst men, traverses and retraverses the streets of Dublin. Long after nightfall, he shares a cup of cocoa, that most domestic of drinks, with Stephen Dedalus. But at no point during the long day does anyone ever say, Are you coming for a pint, Leo? On the contrary, the thirsty patriots, assuming that he has made a killing in the Ascot Gold Cup on the outside, are throwaway, despite the citizens' claim that the white eyed Kaffir never backed the horse in anger in his life. Fully expect that Bloom, the rank outsider, a throwaway, not only from Dublin society, but more important, a throwaway from his own people, will cough up for drinks all round. Is that the way in for the outcast? No matter who or where he is. Ingratiate, shut up, nothing, shut up, say nothing, and buy around. Some years ago, while working on another television production, I sat for a wonderful afternoon with an eminent American Jewish expert and another great Irish writer. There we were, one a Polak, the other a Litvak, both of us exclaiming, examining the pulpolium of Sean O'Casey's Protestant background. I suggest that if you ask the average Dubliner in the street, what O'Casey's religion was, he will swear that he was, of course, a Catholic. As for our very own room, you're more, more than likely to be told, sure that fellow was a Jew man. How wrong can you get? Poor old Ben Bloom Elijah, doomed to be perpetually hounded by that mongrel Gary Ohm, and despite, or maybe indeed, because of his and our own cries of Abba Adonai, forever like the rest of us, to remain suspended at an angle of 45 degrees over Dunyus in Little Greece. Thank you. <laughs>